The Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive, home of the Name Your Price tool. You say how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. It's easy to start a quote. Visit Progressive.com to get started. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, price and coverage match limited by state law. Hi, everyone. This is Jillian with Court Junkie. Court Junkie is a true crime podcast that covers court cases and criminal trials using audio clips and interviews with people close to the cases. Court Junkie is available on Apple Podcasts and podcastone.com. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, a woman leaves her home for a year-long sabbatical from work, but then never returns. Did she decide to start a new life, or was she murdered? And welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my Bonnie co-host, Alice. Oh, I don't know what that means, but it sounds so happy. Yeah, I think it means, like, beautiful in, you know... In Scottish. Scottish, there you go. Yes, I've heard Or Irish, or even English. Yeah. Or Australian, which or would be appropriate. But, you know, there we'll get you into go. That in a second. But you are Bonnie. Yeah. Well, no, no question can, about it. No one can see me, so you know. A Bonnie lass. A Bonnie lass, <laughs> Alice. Well, you have to say it that way. That's much better. A Bonnie lass than a Bonnie Alice. I went to a wedding in Scotland once, and I wore a kilt, and it was awesome. <laughs> We did all these Scottish dances. It was great. I mean, I had so much fun. It was like the most fun I've ever had. Do you still have your kilt? Like, can you bust it I out? I rented it. It was in <sighs> Scotland. You can rent kilts at like a, a shop, just like you can rent tuxes here. Makes so sense. It's pretty cool. I mean, I gotta say, you know, skirts are pretty nice. I, I, I was a fan. I'm I, a fan. I can see why the ladies like them. I am a fan as well. So you know, I wish that you had bought that kilt because then you could be wearing it right now and that would make the bonnie comment even better that would i really tried to convince my wife to let me wear one at our wedding but she was totally opposed so it are didn't you work scottish out. i am i mean not okay. you know 10 <laughs> generations ago or something <laughs> that would be less strange i guess if you actually had you know a scottish background it would probably still be strange but yeah, hey you know. whatever well we're not going to Scotland today, so <laughs> we're talking about Scotland, but that's close. not where the story's going to take us. <laughs> not even close. The other side of the world, as a matter of fact. Yes, today we're going to Australia. Is this our first Australian case? I feel like it is. I think we it is. We have a lot and of you know, listeners. Australia, I've never been to Australia. I would love to go. Is just this like vast wilderness, and I'm surprised we haven't covered a case there yet. There's a lot of great cases out of Australia, and we've got a lot of listeners in Australia. And if they all got together and decided that we should come over there for some podcast event, then we could fly over on the podcast dime and, and see Australia and see our listeners in Australia. So I'm just putting that out there. I'm just putting that out there. It's a possibility. It's a I'd long flight, but I'd be willing to go. <laughs> well, today we are talking about a case that is... Famous in Australia. I'm not sure how famous it is in the United States, but it should be because it is crazy insane. And that is the case of Marion Barter, or Barta, as they say on the Lady Vanishes podcast, which is a <laughs> fantastic podcast. But I have to stop you for just a moment. It's not... <laughs> Your southern what? accent pronouncing 
farter in an Australian accent is just too much for me to handle. I'm sorry. We can cut all this out. I'm sorry. It wasn't the Australian okay, accent. Alice. It was the Southern Australian accent that really got to me. <laughs> well, all right. I'm so sorry. The, you were talking okay. about a phenomenal resource of a podcast that is quite phenomenal literally changing of podcast. this case. Changing this case. And let me just say, I'm not making fun of the way people in Australia talk. It's They're amazing. They're amazing. I love them all. And I love this podcast. And we're going to tell you this story in a couple of episodes. And it's an amazing story. But what you really need to do, if you're interested in this, is listen to the Lady Vanishes podcast. It's a podcast out of Australia. It's done by a news station, I think Channel 7 in Australia. It is amazing. We're going to talk a lot about it and sort of what it has accomplished and why it's a really significant podcast. And it is it is the twists and turns and the shocking reveals are really tremendous. It's still going on right now. So I will say, as I often say, which is just bad for business for us, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you're listening to this show and you don't want The Lady Vanished to be ruined, or The Lady Vanishes, and it's 40 or so episodes on this. Go ahead and stop. And go listen to The Lady Vanishes. You'll get sucked in. You'll be done with it in a couple days. And then you can come back and listen to us. Or you can listen to us, and then you can listen to it for the deep dive in this case. Because they are amazing, and we would not know about this case without it. You would not know about this case without it. And as we're going to talk about, to the extent this case will ever be solved, it will be solved because of that podcast. People ask us sometimes, has a podcast ever solved a case? And the answer is yes. This one, <laughs> to the extent this case is solved, which I kind of feel like it is, and we'll get into our theories at the end, it is because of the Lady Vanishes and the work they've done. So it is amazing, and if you haven't heard of it, and if you love deep dives, this is a great one. If you love the sort of long-form deep dive podcast on one case, this is the podcast for you. Yeah, Brett. I mean, this is such a cool um, – it's unfolding in real time, and they are quite literally doing investigative – and legal steps is if you listen to it and we'll talk about in real time and it's unfolding for the podcast audience and you get to see what good a podcast or just really media attention can have on a case like this. So we're excited to cover it and, and you should go listen to them as well, of course. Alice, before we continue, I want to talk about one of our favorite sponsors, stamps.com. You know, it's a little weird to think about, but this podcast is kind of like a small business. And those of you out there with a small business know it's not small to you. And you can't afford to miss out on opportunities to grow and keep your customers wanting more. And you know that time is money. And you don't want to waste either with repeated trips to the post office. That's where stamps.com comes in. You can skip the trip and focus on how to take your small business to the next level. Stamps.com lets you print official postage right from your computer and saves you money in the process. So you can spend less time at the post office and more time making your customers happy. You're right, Brett. You know, we uh, time is money for us. We just don't have a lot of time with full-time jobs, podcasting, and small kids. Well, for more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Stamps.com gives you access to all the post office and UPS shipping services you need right from your computer. All you need is a computer and standard printer. No special supplies or equipment. So stop overpaying for shipping with Stamps.com. Sign up with promo code PROSECUTE for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code PROSECUTE. Brett, before we move on, I'm excited to talk about Ferity. Verity makes the highest quality, timeless clothing, and I have just gotten my Haley dress that I have been sporting everywhere because it's timeless, it's beautiful, and it's high quality. The best thing is Ferity has a lifetime guarantee of quality. If there's anything wrong with my dress, they'll fix it 
or replace it, no matter what. Their clothing blends timeless heritage appeal with modern design and functionality. And they're a family-run brand fueled by perfectionism, purpose, and optimism. They're really unwilling to settle for anything that's not amazing. Yeah, Alice, with summer coming up, I wanted to find myself a new shirt that I could wear, both in you know, semi-formal events, but also just out. And I got the short sleeve breeze shirt in faded floral batik. I love it, and I know that you will too. And like Alice said, Faraday has a lifetime guarantee of quality, and they are obsessive about every detail, and that's why no one does it better. So join us in finding out why Faraday has just such timeless clothing. You can find it at FaradayBrand.com. Ladies, let's talk about something that we don't talk enough about, and that is how to effectively relieve symptoms that accompany hormonal fluctuations within our body. Well, no worries, because now Bonafide is here to help. Bonafide was created to give women an alternative to effectively relieve the symptoms that come with the hormones that we face daily because every woman deserves relief without compromise. And to provide women with naturally powerful remedies to safely treat the natural symptoms that occur throughout our lives, from PMS to menopause and everything else along the way, Bonafide creates proprietary natural medical products that have earned the uncompensated recommendation of over 80 8,300 doctors to their patients on an ongoing basis. So give Bonafide a try today. No hormones and no prescription required. Real relief without compromise. And you can get 20% off your first purchase when you subscribe to any product and up to 56% off when you subscribe to multiple products by going to hellobonafide.com slash prosecutors and use promo code prosecutors that's hello b-o-n-a-f-i-d-e dot com slash prosecutors and code prosecutors for up to 56 percent off at checkout yeah this was one of those i listened to this podcast and i was like we have to do this and i don't know how much we're going to add to what they've done but we just had to cover it so we're covering it for you and this is one of those cases we talked last week about a case where someone, Lori Ruff, actually decided to disappear and start a new life and leave her old life behind. And we talked about how rare that was and how rarely you see that and how often that theory comes up in our other cases. Well, we are following that up with another case where some people believe that's exactly what happened. And that's sort of the question at the heart of this podcast. Did Marion Barter decide to leave on her own to start a new life, or did something sinister happen to her? And as we walk through the evidence, you'll sort of develop your own theory, but just know there are twists and turns in this one. So just when you think you know what's going on, you're going to get switched around. So with that, let's dive into the story. When 51-year-old Marion Barter told her daughter Sally she wanted to quit her job, sell her house, and go on a one-year vacation to Europe, Sally was surprised, which I think anybody would be surprised if their mother told them at 50, hey, I'm going to quit my job and disappear for a year. What do you think? But she was also happy. Marion, she hadn't been the same lately, and Sally had noticed that she had been sad and she had been stressed. There had been nights when she had found her crying in her home alone. She seemed unhappy and she seemed unfulfilled. And that was despite the fact that she had really accomplished a lot in the time around when she made this momentous decision. Only a year before, Marion, who was known as a tremendous teacher had been named the best teacher in all of New South Wales, which is a province in Australia, on the eastern part, the eastern shore of Australia. But Envy followed that win, and she'd heard whispers from other teachers at this elite boys' school where she was teaching, and they were critical. Some of them said that she was too strict with the children. And there were even some that made much darker accusations that whispered that 
maybe Marion had had some inappropriate contact with some of the young boys at the school. Marion was devastated by these accusations. Teaching was her life. She loved it and she loved her students. And never before had anyone made any kind of accusations like this. And she decided, coming off that award, being the teacher of the year, that nevertheless she needed to get away. So her daughter wished her well, and Marion packed her bags and headed off for the United Kingdom. She planned on spending a few weeks there before striking off on the Orient Express, a trip she had always wanted to take and that she had described to others as her dream. She leaves. Her family wishes her well. Postcards follow from towns across the south of England. On August the 1st, Marion calls Sally from a payphone, and this is August 1st, 1997, by the way. This is where the story starts. It's 1997. On August 1st, 1997, Marion calls Sally from a payphone and talks to her until her money quite literally ran out. She told her daughter that she loved her, but that she would be out of touch for a while, that she really wanted to take a holiday away from everything. She really wanted to get away. She wanted to bury herself in this and really experience the traveling lifestyle that she was now embracing. And her daughter told her that was fine. And she wished her well. And it was the last time she would ever speak to her mother. Now, Marion fell silent as she said she would. But when Sally's brother Owen had his birthday in October and Marion didn't bother to call, the family became concerned. Marion had her faults, but she loved birthdays and she'd never miss one. So concern turned to panic when Sally learned that someone had drained her mother's bank account from a beachside town not far from where Sally lived. Sally reported her mother missing. A few days later, Sally received shocking news. Her mother had been found by the police, but she wanted to be left alone. She had decided to start a new life, and she wanted nothing to do with her children. When Sally was married the next year, Marion did not show up for the wedding. And when her father died a few years later, Marion did not attend the funeral. Even when Owen, Marion's son, committed suicide tragically in 2002, Marion did not return. Sally's family urged her to move on, to forget her mother. Clearly, you know, she had reported her mother missing. She had been found and her mother just wanted a new life so much so that even amidst all of these momentous family occasions, both happy and tragic, her mother made it clear she did not want to be part of their lives anymore and she wanted her own new life. So even though Sally was sad and even hesitant to accept this, everyone else around her urged her, forget about your mom. She doesn't care about this life she left behind. Let her be. Move on. But Sally never bought it. She never believed that her mother had left on her own. She suspected something much darker was at work. And now, 25 years after her mother disappeared, it seems Sally just might have been right. I mean, this is crazy. I think you can already see why this is such an interesting case, because you have a situation where, yeah, there were things going on in her life, and we're going to talk more about that, but it wasn't as if she had a bad relationship with her kids. She was very close to Sally, and... There was no indication that she would, even if she wanted to move away. And there, and she had said, she had said to Sally, look, I'm going to go to England. And if I like it, I might even stay there. I might just live in England. And Sally said, great. I mean, Sally was about as understanding as you could possibly be as a daughter. And if you listen to The Lady Vanishes, they do a lot of interviews with Sally. And Sally says, you know, we were grown. Owen and I were grown. We had our own lives. We had our own things going on. Our mother didn't have to take care of us, and if this is what she needed to do to be happy, 
she had she had dedicated her whole life to us. It was time for her to to do something for herself, and that would have been fine. If she wanted to move to England, that would be fine. We would miss her, but it wouldn't be something just that we couldn't accept. And so it doesn't feel like a situation where someone would think, I have to start a new life. It doesn't feel like Marion was tied down, I guess is what I'm trying to say, in the way that you would think someone would need to be tied down to want to get away. We, we sort of talked about this with Ben McDaniel, how when he disappeared, his life was pretty good. He had settled a lot of the problems that he had before. He had cut a lot of the ties. He was ready to start a new life without disappearing. And so it didn't really make sense that he would want to disappear on his own. And the same thing with Marion. Marion's kind of got what she wants. She's starting a new life. But then she vanishes literally after talking to her daughter on the telephone and you think this has to be foul play. Something has to have gone wrong. She was murdered or, or something. And, and Sally clearly thinks that. And she reports her mother missing. And then you have this shocking moment where the police come back and say, no, sorry, we found her. And she says she doesn't want anything to do with you. She wants to start a new life. Sorry. And like Alice said, everybody in Sally's life tells her, you got to just let her go. But she doesn't. Anyway, so let's look at the timeline in this case and really see how some of this develops. So Marion Wilson is born on October 3rd, 1945. And in December of 1967, when she's 22 years old, she marries Johnny Warren, who is the captain of the Australian national football team and regarded by many as the greatest soccer player in Australian History. I mean, this is this is a big deal. This is another thing. This is not just some random teacher. I mean, this is someone who was married to one of the most important figures in Australian history, the the captain of the Socceroos, which is what I guess they call them in Australia. And the two were described as madly in love. Johnny is leading the Australian team to the World Cup for the first time ever. They're in love. They're building this new life. But as it often goes with big stars, whether it be in sports or anywhere else, Johnny's soccer schedule is taking him away from home for months at a time. And there's a lot of debate about what happened, whether it's just because of Johnny's wanderlust or maybe Marion had some infidelity on her own part the marriage falls apart. The time apart is too much. And for whatever reason, and different people tell different stories, it doesn't work out. And by 1969, they are divorced. And according to everyone who knows Marion, despite the fact that this was a marriage that only lasted a couple years, Johnny was the love of her life. He was the love of her life, and she never got over him. Till the day she left for England, she never got over him, and she spent most of her life trying to fill the void that Johnny left behind when he walked out of her life. In 1973, only four years later, Marion has Sally, her daughter, by her new boyfriend, Stuart Brown. Her son, Owen, follows in 1974, and the two are married in 1977. But once again, after they get married, things just don't work out. And they are divorced in 1979. Now Sally and Owen are very close. They're very close in age. People often mistake them for twins. And they have this really strong bond that will continue for the rest of their life. In 1985, Marion marries Ray Barter. Now, Ray and Owen did not get along, and this was this caused a split in the family that never really healed. At some point, Owen decides he can't take it anymore. There's some people who say that Ray gave Marion an ultimatum. It's either me or him, and she chose Ray. It's a little unclear on that, but what we know for sure is that Owen leaves to live with his father, and for the rest of his life, he would feel like Marion chose Ray over him, and it was a trauma that would haunt him until the end of his days. 
But despite whatever Marion may or may not have done, it wasn't enough because by 1990, Marion and Ray are divorced. In November 1993, Marion moves to the Gold Coast in New South Wales where she takes a job at the Southport School, which is an elite all-boys school in the area. This is sort of the culmination of her career. She had been a teacher for a while. This was a job she really wanted, and she was hired, and immediately everyone thought that she was one of the most amazing teachers they had ever met. She buys a home for $180,000, and there's everything that there is everything to indicate that here in 1993, she is starting a life in a place that she will be for the rest of her life. In 1994, an ad runs in the foreign language newspaper, Le Courier Australien. It is written in Luxembourgese, a dialect of French spoken in Luxembourg, and seeks a woman for companionship and possible marriage. It is signed by a M.F. Remencall. Now, in 1996, Marion is named Queensland Teaching Excellence Award, which we've already talked about. And this award essentially makes her the top teacher in the province. It is a huge honor. And she will tell her daughter that following this, some teachers became envious of her and started spreading rumors about her behavior. In 1997, things start heating up. April 25th, Marion sells her home for $165,000, which is at a loss of $15,000. She sells the house in a matter of three weeks, and it's clear that speed is more important to her than getting the best possible deal as she's taking a loss on this sale. She tells her daughter she wants to downsize. She also tells her that she's decided to go on a year-long trip to England, Europe, and the Orient Express. Sally is surprised, but she wants her mom to be happy, so she encourages the trip. On May 15th, Marion changes her name, unbeknownst to Sally and those around her, to... Florabella Natalia Marion Remencall and acquires a new passport under this new name. She doesn't tell anyone. And another thing that's surprising by the timing of all this. Now, note, it's April when she's selling her home. She's telling her daughter she wants to go on this trip and she wants to do it immediately. Now, to those of us here in the States, that might seem like a pretty good time, right? School's about to close up. It's the end of April. It's May 15th when she gets the passport. This is perfect timing. Not in Australia. In Australia, that is the middle of the school year. Remember, they're down under, so all the seasons are mixed up. I assume that their summer, if, if schools even take a big summer break in Australia, is more towards the December, January, February time frame than it is June in the in the podcast, they talk about how summer was ending in February, and it's just kind of messed my mind up. But in any event, she's literally in the middle of the school year when she's doing this. So this is very strange because she is a very careful, dedicated teacher. She loves her students. She wants to do best by them. And yet she's essentially leaving them in the middle of the year to do this thing that she wants to do. So on June 8th, Marion attends an engagement party for her daughter, Sally, and her future son-in-law, Chris. Marion asks the Southport School if they can use the chapel at the school for the wedding. Now, this is an honor that is ordinarily reserved for graduates of the school. When recall, it's an all-boys school. But even though Marion is kind of leaving them in the lurch, everyone there loves her so much, particularly the headmaster loves her so much, that he says, absolutely, if you want to have your daughter married here, you absolutely can do that. And there was a feeling that Marion would come back. I mean, we sort of know the score. We know what's going to happen here. But everybody there thought she's going to go. She's going to she's gonna do this thing. She's going to be gone for a year. Then she's going to come back rested and relaxed and recharged. And they were, they were going to have her back because she was... One of the best, one of the best teachers they had, and so if 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 she wants her daughter to be married there, all the better. And this is also interesting, right? Because at what a happy time engagement party! I know 
you may be making big changes in your life, but all of this does seem to happen so closely in time to what some would probably view to be the peak of her career. You know, many people may strive for an award like the one she has won, the Queensland Teaching Excellence Award, and she's achieved it. Not only has she achieved it, but it's in the field that she loves. She's passionate about this area, and she doesn't seem to strike me as someone who, all right, I reached the peak, I'm done now. You know, rather, it's just a cherry on top of her doing her job. She wasn't doing her career. She wasn't working in her career to get awards. It's just that she was so good at it and loved teaching so much that it was recognized through this award. So for her to step back at this time seems a little bit strange for her to leave something she loves so much. And if you listen to The Lady Vanishes, I mean, this was one reason a lot of people had a hard time believing that she would disappear on her own because she did love teaching so much. And she was, you know, And you hear this a lot about teachers. I mean, there are people who are, they are just, they are teachers. That is what they are. That's what they were put on this earth to do. And it's not just a job for them. It's not just a profession. It's not just a career. It is their being. And it seems like Marion was one of these people. This was why she was born, was to teach. And most people who talk about that, who talk about her on the podcast, that's what they say is there was nobody more dedicated to this than her. Can't imagine her doing anything else. And even when she talked about staying in Europe, it was, I might stay in Europe and find a job there or open a school there. She was still going to be a teacher. And so leaving in the middle of the school year was a weird thing and really struck a lot of people. It's strange. It's strange. And obviously even more so when she never came back. So sometime around this, we just talked about June 8th. It's a little unclear the exact date here, but we'll say sometime between the beginning of June and about June 21st, on one of the nights in the lead up to her departure, Chris and Sally, who are engaged, are getting ready to get married, apparently they like to go to McDonald's. And so they go out to McDonald's one night and they're having themselves a cheeseburger and some french fries. And they look out the window and across the street, there's a gas station. And they see Marion at this gas station, pull up to this gas station in her car. And what they're surprised to see is she's not alone. In fact, in the car is a tall man with dark hair. Now, Sally tries to get a good look at him, not because she's concerned, but more because she's curious. She can't really see him, but Marion at some point looks back through the window at McDonald's, sees them. And Sally says she kind of looks startled. And she jumps back in the car, and they end up, they actually end up going through the drive through at McDonald's, not to get anything, but that was the way they had to get out of the parking lot. And Sally kind of points and laughs at her through the window, thinking this is a funny thing. She's been caught with maybe some new boyfriend. Of course, later on, Sally asks her, hey, who was that guy in the car at the gas station? And Marion laughs it off and says, that was just a friend that I met at the arts center and he wanted to take me out for one last drink before before i left no big deal and sally thinks okay that makes sense and it is not until much later that she even thinks about that on june 20th marion officially resigns her position at the southport school and as i said she does so despite just winning this award and the fact that it is the middle of the school year in Australia, but she's so beloved that if she wants to come back, even though she left them in a lurch, she'll be able to do so. The next day, June 21st, Marion asks Sally if she can come over for dinner, and it is the night before she is supposed to leave on her trip. She comes over, Sally makes a big dinner, and it's one of those joyous occasions that only in retrospect has sort of a dark tenor to it. On June 22nd, a friend drops Marion off at the bus station. It is the last time she is seen by any of her old friends. The Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey, podcast listeners, whether you love true crime or comedies, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance too. 
Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Alice, we've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show, a podcast you should definitely check out since you're a fan of high-quality, fascinating podcasts hosted by interesting people. The show covers such a wide range of topics through weekly interviews with heavy-hitting guests, and there are a ton of episodes you'll find interesting since you're a fan of this show. Two of the episodes I really enjoyed was Jordan's interview with Amanda Knox, who was famous for being falsely accused of murder in Italy, and an episode on whether or not you're a psychopath, so choose wisely whether you want to listen to that one. The show covers stories like how a professional art forger sometime, somehow made millions of dollars while being chased by the feds and the mafia. Jordan's also done an episode all about birth control and how it can alter the partners we pick. The podcast covers a lot, but one constant is his ability to pull useful pieces of advice from his guests. I promise you'll find something useful that you can apply to your own life, whether that's an actionable routine change that boosts your productivity or just a slight mindset tweak that changes how you see the world. We really enjoy this show and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. On June 30th to August 30th, postcards and letters from England are postmarked and sent to friends, relatives, and teachers at the Southport School by Marion. One of the letters Sally receives is written on stationery from Narita Airport in Tokyo. In other words, all things that would be expected as Marion is going on on this kind of worldwide tour of places she has wanted to see for a long time and she's in regular contact from the places that she says she's going to and in fact they are from there because they um, bear the postmark of the locations in which she is visiting now on august 1st Sally receives a call from her mother from Tunbridge Wells, England. Marion is concerned about a landslide that has killed several people at a ski resort Sally and her fiancé Chris had visited. It turns out they had left the day before. By the way, what this shows me is even though Marion is far away, she still obviously cares very much about her daughter and her soon-to-be um, son-in-law that, you know, if she hears about this landslide, her immediate thought is, oh my goodness, I, you know, are Sally and Chris okay? That concern is, I think, very typical of Marion, very typical of uh, Marion as a mother as well. And so this is not a surprising piece of conversation for them. But what comes next is what's confusing. So Marion and Sally talk for a while. Sally assures her, I'm fine. We actually left you know, we are not in harm's way. And they talk until Marion's money runs out. The call keeps dropping. And on the final call, Marion tells her daughter just to talk and she will listen to her. Sally talks until the call ends. And it's the last time she hears from her mother. On August 2nd, Florabella Natalia Marion Remencall, or someone using her passport, arrives at Brisbane Airport. She says she intends to stay in Australia for three days on her papers when she enters the country. On August 13th, Marion's Medicare card is used at an ophthalmologist in Grafton, Australia. So whoever's using this note is coming back into Australia 
even though the last word we had from Marion was that she was continuing on her trip and the last known place she was calling from was England. And I want to talk about this August 1st day for a second, because to me, there's something so tragically poignant about this, and you put your finger on it. Imagine for a second that when Marion left, she intended to leave her life behind. And she intended never to come back. And the postcards were just sort of a smokescreen, right? I mean, you can see that. You can imagine that happening. I'm leaving. I'm not coming back. I got to keep people not paying attention until I get myself set up somewhere. So I'll send the postcards so people think, oh, it's normal, but I'm really, you know, building my house in the forest of Germany or whatever. (laughs) But I want to make people think that I'm still doing what I said I was going to do. That all makes sense. But the phone call feels a lot different. Because if you decide to do that, you really have to make a serious emotional, mental, psychological choice, right? You have to decide, I am never going to speak to my children again. I am starting a new life. Never going to speak to them. Never going to speak to any of my family. And... It's always one of the reasons I find it hard to believe people do this. We know people do this. I mean, we talked about it last week, an example of someone who did it. So people do it. It's not like it never happens. But this is one of those where it's really hard for me to put myself in someone else's shoes and imagine how you could do it. And it's one of the reasons that I always doubt this as a possibility in our cases, that we always try and look at them and look at them seriously without bias. I still doubt it internally. I can't get over it because I can't imagine doing it. I can't imagine making that psychological, emotional choice to never speak to the people I love again. But you have to make that choice. And you have to think that Marion made that choice. So what is this? What is August 1st? Is it a slip? Is it she thought for a second her daughter could have been horribly wounded or killed, and even though she had tried to build this wall of separation that was going to last for a lifetime, she couldn't do it, and she had to call and make sure she was okay? Was it that? Or is it a sign that maybe there wasn't a wall? Or had she always intended that August the 1st would be it, that that would be the day she was going to call her daughter, she was going to talk to her for as long as she could, and in this, in this, like I said, this, this very poignant moment where she basically says to her, you know, the call keeps dropping, you just talk, and I'm just going to listen to you. You just tell me everything you want to tell me, and I'm just going to listen to you until the phone call drops away. And then it does, and then that's it. Like, that was that the moment? Had she decided that was it? Like, once that phone call dropped away, she was never going to speak to her daughter again? I mean, I don't know. And that's one of the great mysteries to this case. But this day, to me, is just so significant. And it's so sad, um, you know, if if Marion really did intend to start a new life and never see her family again, she clearly loves Sally. And this this kind of last bit where she says, you know, your, your call's dropping, just keep talking, I'll listen, is so sad um, from a mother's perspective, like... I I just want to grasp every last wisp of you um, that I can capture, even though we're no longer in a conversation. I just want to kind of close my eyes and hold you as close to me as I can. But here's the crazy thing. I imagine that as a mother who's watching their daughter slip away and they have no control over it. She is in control of the slipping away, which is what's so confusing. She doesn't have to say goodbye to her daughter. (laughs) Her daughter wants to be in relationship with her and her daughter would love for her to call many more times. Of course, Sally doesn't know at this time. This is the last time she'll speak to her. But I can almost feel the sadness from Marion's side because she knows it'll be the last time. But I'm confused because if she's sad, it's in her control. She didn't have to make this be the last time. And I don't want to make light of this, and I'm not making light of this, but it's almost like that scene, or she's reenacting that scene in Armageddon where Bruce Willis is talking to um, Liv Tyler for the last time over the screen. It's like the really sad moment in Armageddon. They're touching the screens, and And they're like, "This is the last time." Yes, absolutely. Exactly, and and it's it's like she's doing that, but like you said, 
she doesn't have to. Like, Bruce Willis is about to sacrifice himself to save the Earth, you know? <laughs> Which is what Bruce Willis would do, because he's a hero. But she doesn't have to do that. You know, she's not on an asteroid. She can just come home. And it is a very weird thing. And on the one hand, it's like, is it just a sign of weakness that she, but she steeled herself so much that this is what she has to do? And look, if your mind is racing out there listening to this, trying to imagine what it must be, like there must be something so significant that would make you do this. Like, it must be something huge that would make you leave your daughter, who you clearly love, behind and never speak to her again. There must be something massive there, right? I mean, that's what you just feel like it has to be. Something huge. Something like an asteroid's about to crash into the Earth, right? Like, that's the kind of thing it takes for you to decide, I'm never going to see my kids again. And remember, we've already talked about this when we talked about the story. Marion's going to disappear. She's going to do what she said she's going to do, or what... We assume she wanted to do at this point. And then her son is going to die. He's going to kill himself. And there's not a word from her, which is very different from what we see here. Here we see my daughter might be in danger. I need to find her. I need to call her, right? Then the son dies and there's nothing. And there's and there's nothing for her daughter either. There's no reaching out to her to make sure you, know, you just lost your brother your your who was as close to you as if he were your twin, but nothing, not a sound and you know that is a a sharp juxtaposition between these two days mm, certainly so you have this August first deal where Marion talks to her daughter, and this is the conversation that we mentioned earlier, where Marion essentially says to Sally. Okay, you know, I've sent a lot of postcards, I've talked to you on the phone, but just let everybody know that the postcards are going to slow down, the letters are going to slow down, because honestly, it's taken me forever just to write all this stuff. I don't have time, I really want to dive into this experience, I'm loving this more than I even thought I would. And she even says she's loving England so much, she's going to put off going on the Orient Express for a little while. She's going to continue to explore the south of England she's having such a great time, but she really wants to immerse herself in it. And, you know, I don't know, Alice, I guess we've talked about this a little bit, traveling and when you travel by yourself. I've traveled by myself on a few occasions. It's not what I enjoy the most. I prefer to be with someone. But I will say this, when you are alone, that is when you really do sort of immerse yourself in the place that you're in because you don't have anybody else. You know, you can't you don't have a friend who's a crutch where you can talk about football or whatever, right? Like all you have is you and this wonderful culture that you're in and you really can sort of immerse yourself in that. And I feel like that's what she's saying. Like, I really want to do that. So I want to cut off these ties for just a little while, not forever, but just a little while and really experience this. Right. And that doesn't seem that drastic, right? Absolutely. Just, you know, dive into an experience. You don't want to have to Maybe I'll reach out if I want to, but I don't want you to worry if you don't hear from me because I'm just going to be so immersed in this experience. That seems less drastic than we have a personal conflict and I will not. I will be cutting you out of my life. Right? Those are two very different approaches and also even if they may actually result in the same effect. No, I think it's perfectly reasonable. I think it's a perfectly reasonable thing to say. And Sally buys it hook, line, and sinker, and it buys time for Marion. You know, sort of imagining what exactly is going on here. Put yourself in the Marion wants to disappear and she needs time. Well, she's just bought herself a lot of time to do whatever she needs to do. And apparently what she needs to do is to go back to Australia. So she goes back to Australia, as Alice said, she arrives, or someone using that passport, the passport that she took out in May with this new name, comes back to Australia. And between August, when she arrives, and sometime in the middle of September, every day for several weeks, someone withdraws $5,000, which is the daily limit from Marion's bank account in banks in Burley Head and Byron Bay, which are both cities on the Gold Coast, and they're not far from where Sally lives. In fact, they're places that Marion had frequented 
places that she had been so often that there's some thought that this was this was risky for her because anyone could have seen her and recognized her. These are not huge towns and they're places that she had spent some time. We're going to have a map up on the website. If you're on YouTube, you may be looking at it right now, which will show you sort of some of the important locations in this case, including where Southport is, where Burley Head is, where Byron Bay is, where the airport, Brisbane airport is. And you'll see these are all very close to each other. You know, they, these are all places on the Gold Coast, places that she was familiar with. But in any event, this person's going in every day and they're taking $5,000 out of their bank account. That's August to sometime in the middle of September. On October 17th, Owen, who was Marion's son, has his birthday and she does not call him. And Brett, that's two and a half months after she says, I'm going to dive into this experience. Maybe if you don't hear from someone for a, a couple weeks or even a month, but two and a half months later, you would think the allure of being cut off from the world has worn off to the point where you're like, oh, my, my baby boy, his birthday, this, this matters, right? Especially for someone like Marion who loves birthdays. And Sally actually says that she, by about this time, She's getting a little concerned. She knows Marion said she's going to be out of touch, but she's starting to have some concerns about this, but she's sort of marked in her own mind this day, October 17th, because she's thinking we'll hear from her then. She's going to call. That's when we'll hear from her. No big deal. She's having a great time. But then the 17th comes and the 17th goes, and, and Sally doesn't hear from her mother, and neither does Owen. So Sally gives it a couple days just to make sure just to make sure that Owen's not going to get a late birthday call. But they don't hear anything. And Sally talks to Owen, and he confirms, no, I have not heard a word from our mother, not a phone call, not a postcard, not a letter, nothing. So Sally, she thinks, well, Mom's traveling around the world. That's not exactly cheap. The easiest thing I can do, I'll just call the bank. And I'll just say, hey, you know, is money still coming out in England or maybe somewhere on the Orient Express? And if they say yes, well, that's mom and everything's fine. So she calls up the bank and the bank sort of gives her the runaround and says, well, you know, we can't really tell you what's going on on somebody's account. You know, sorry, that's not something we can we can really talk about. But as the teller is saying this to her, she's looking at the account and on the phone, Sally hears this sort of audible gasp and the teller says, Look, everything I just said is true. I'm not supposed to tell you this, but I'm looking at this bank account and the money's not coming out in England. It's not coming out in Wales or France or, you know, somewhere along the Orient Express, wherever the Orient Express goes through, Astana or Khartoum or whatever. It's not coming out there. It's coming out from Burley Head and it's coming out from Byron Bay and somebody's taking $5,000 a day out. And they've been doing this for months, or for the last two months. And Sally, obviously, freaks out because she can't understand what's going on. So she and her husband, they drive up to Byron Bay, and they sort of go around Byron Bay, and they hit all the locations that her mom would frequent because this was a place she went fairly often. She went there to shop. She went there to sort of spend some time. They went to cafes. They went to stores where they knew Marion. They said, hey, have you seen her? And they're all like, no, we haven't seen her in a long time, months. So nobody had seen her. And so finally they go to the bank. And this is October 22nd now. They go to the bank and they have a picture of Marion. And they show the picture to the teller. And the teller looks at the picture and he gets kind of hinky about it. And he goes into the back and he talks to the manager for a while. And then he comes back out and he's just very sort of cagey about whether or not he's seen the person in the photograph or not. And this also raises some alarms for Sally. And so at this point, she goes to the police. She goes to the Byron Bay police, and she reports her mother missing. And she assumes, you know, this is a big step, but a necessary step. And now the police are going to be on it, and hopefully they'll get to the bottom of it. And she can hope that they'll do so quickly. And boy, do they ever. It's only a couple days later when the police call her and they say, 
We have found your mother. We've talked to her. She has decided to start a new life, and she does not want to speak to you ever again. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine the blow to Sally who's been worried for, you know, a while at this point, but certainly for the last week and a half, and is driving around Australia looking not far from where she lives, really about 30 minutes from where she lives, thinking, my mom's been here all along. That makes no sense for her not to be in contact with us, and worried sick, convinced that someone has stolen her identity, has taken her hostage, has done something worse to her mother, and then to get this report from the police who she trusts. That's why she went to the police in the first place saying, your mom has a message for you and it's that she's fine and doesn't want to talk to you anymore. I can't imagine anything more shocking than that. I can't imagine. I mean, it's like a bomb going off in your life. That's more shocking to me than if the police came and told her that Marion was dead because 100%. that's almost expected. <laughs> Mm hmm. 100%. Yeah. You, you would, that would be something that would be shocking. Any, any kind of phone call, even if it were out of the blue, even if Marion, none of this had happened with her son, say it was, you know, a few days after she talked to her, and all of a sudden she gets a phone from Scotland Yard and they say, Your mother's been murdered. That would be shocking, incredibly shocking. She might even be in denial and say, That can't be right. I just talked to her. All that sort of thing. Nothing can, I don't know that anything can compare to this. This has to be the most shocking piece of news a person can hear, which is your mother, who you thought loved you and you just talked to, and she seemed like she really cared about you, is now saying she never wants to talk to you again. Loved you so much that as it was disconnecting, said, keep talking, honey. I just want to hear your voice, even though the call keeps breaking up. I just love hearing your voice. So, so she hears this news, this crazy, insane news and uh, i mean she reacts i think the way you'd expect her to which is in disbelief she just can't believe that this is true she asks the police well can i talk to her and the police say no because marion hasn't done anything wrong she has an absolute right to disappear if she wants to she has an absolute right to start a new life and never talk to her kids again that's something she can do and so the police are in this weird place on the one hand, they have someone reporting someone missing. And on the other hand, they found the someone and they're saying, I'm not missing, I'm starting a new life. So the police can't really help her. Well, it turns out, and I didn't know this, and maybe it's just in Australia, but the Salvation Army apparently has a family tracing unit that you can engage to go find someone who's disappeared. And in February of 2008, Sally... And Marion's father get together and they engage the Salvation Army to do this. That's in February. So on March 18th, the Salvation Army responds that indeed they have spoken to a missing persons officer who directed them to bank security at the Ashmore branch of Marion's bank, which is yet another city on the Gold Coast that Marion apparently had visited and taken money out of. And bank security confirms that on October 15th, 1997, Marion withdrew the balance of her bank account and spoke of starting a new life, and that when she was contacted, she confirmed that she did not want to have anything to do with her family. And the bank was absolutely adamant that tellers and other people who had seen Marion in the flesh when she came in to take this money confirmed it was her. So she, she drained her entire bank account. She'd been draining it slowly, but she completely finished it off just two days before her son's birthday, which I think is so poignant as well, because this drawing of the last bit of her money kind of shuts down that old life. And it's so close in time to a joyous day that she typically loves to celebrate. It's as if it's like an exclamation point on the, I'm ending my old life, no matter what, you know, anniversary or birthday or celebratory event is coming up. It's not like, oh, I'll just get through this happy birthday and then I'll start my new life. It's as if she can't wait to truly close the door on the old life. On October 24th, Sally is married to Chris. Remember, it was Marion who got 
her school that didn't usually allow non-graduates to have events there to, for Sally and Chris to have their engagement party there just about, what, a year and a half earlier. And it's a joyous day back then, but here she is getting married and Marion does not attend. Fast forward in 2001, Sally gives birth to her first daughter, Ella, Marion's first grandchild. Again, nothing from Marion. Fast forward another year in 2002, March 7th of that year, Owen, who had struggled with drug addiction and many demons throughout his life, commits suicide. Marion does not attend Owen's funeral. There's no word from Marion whatsoever, not a word of support, not a word of you know, sadness, nothing. Fast forward yet another year, and Marion's father dies. Again, no word from Marion. She does not attend the funeral. Yeah, I mean, you just have all these events happening in the life of this family that she's left behind, and Sally is the one bearing the brunt of all of them. Uh, look, I don't know how close Marion was to Owen. Obviously, they had some issues throughout his life, and depending on who you believe... That relationship might have been pretty fractured, but it's pretty clear that Marion was close to Sally. Sally talks about when Marion was going through all this at the Southport School and these accusations that people were whispering about her, and that she went over to her house and Marion just kind of cried and fell asleep in her arms while her daughter held her. So I don't think there's any question that Marion loved Sally, and Sally is the one left to deal with all of this. And she's, she's, I mean, she has her husband who they're married to this day. He's obviously a pillar of support for her, but she needs her mom too. And her mom's not there for her. And no matter what happens and no matter how bad it gets, whatever self-imposed exile Marion has put herself in, she's not breaking it. She's not coming out. She's not talking to Sally. And everyone in the family is telling Sally you just got to let this go. She's made this decision. You just got to let it go. And for a while, Sally does that. But by 2007, 10 years after Marion's disappeared, Sally's she's had enough. And she just never really bought this. She never really believed it. And so she reaches out to the Australian Federal Police which is sort of the National Police Force of Australia, kind of like the FBI, though based on the description of it in The Lady Vanishes, I don't think it has as much power as the FBI does. But nevertheless, a nationwide police force, and they just happen to be having a public campaign to raise awareness for missing persons, and in fact to raise awareness for missing persons who may have disappeared on their own, and they ask Sally if Marion can be the face of this campaign, and Sally thinks this is great. What a great way to get to the bottom of what happened and maybe even find my mom. We can do this campaign. But at the last minute, the New South Wales police, the police who she initially went to, the police who initially contacted Marion, and who still have jurisdiction... They refuse the request that the Australian Federal Police make to use Marion's case, and they have the power to do that. To them, she's not a missing person. She's a person who's decided to disappear on their own, and she has the right to do that, as we've said, and they've decided they're going to defend her right to do that, even if it means that Sally's not going to be able to find out exactly what happened. Sally keeps pushing, though. She keeps pushing. In 2009... Byron Bay, which is the police force that she had initially reported Marion missing to, finally assigns a new person to the case, Detective Senior Constable Gary Shaheen. Now, he goes through the file, and after reviewing it, he marks Marion as found and makes this official. To the extent she was a missing person at all, she no longer is. Sally doesn't understand this, and he'll explain to her that, look, based on everything we've seen, all our indications are that she's fine and she disappeared on her own. And since she wasn't missing, 
She had been found. Because in that sort of perfect bureaucratic system that we always have, there are only two categories. You're either a missing person or you're a found person. And since she wasn't a missing person, she must be a found person. And the responsibility for the police now was to protect Marion's privacy. This is not exactly on point, but that leads into like a deeper philosophical question of what it means to be lost and what it means to be found. I mean, I think it absolutely does. And it's a really interesting question because what does it mean to Sally? Her mother is missing. She has no idea where she was or what happened to her. To the police, she's found. And you got to remember, and I don't know if we've made this explicit yet, but the police talked to her on the phone and they talked to bank security and they talked to people who saw Marion. They built a pretty good case that Marion's still alive. But it's not like they sat down with her in an apartment somewhere and had a discussion with her about, are you okay? Is everything fine? They never saw her. And to Sally, that doesn't mean she's found. It means maybe you have a good idea that she's found, but you didn't see her. And you, by the way, have no idea where she was or where she is. By 2009, when all this is going on, they have no idea where Marion was. They couldn't, even if they wanted to tell Sally, they couldn't tell her. And that's this weird thing that's going on. If you listen to the Lady Vanishes podcast, they talk to this detective, and he says things like, well, we had to protect her privacy, and she was found. But I kept looking at the case, because I really wanted to find her for Sally. And it's like, wait, is she found, or is she not found? You know, and he's dealing with this weird thing where he wants Sally to know for certain that her mother's okay. But he doesn't actually think her mother's missing. He just wants to find her... So he can say, yes, Sally, she's fine. Stop looking. That's sort of his thing at this point. And it's in this very strange limbo where nobody's really looking, but they're kind of looking. And she's not really missing, but she is missing. And it's a very weird place that they're in. Well, we're going to stop for now. The next important thing that's going to happen is Channel 7 News is going to show up and they're going to start this podcast and that's going to get us to where we are today. And we have so many things to talk about. Those of you who are listening closely, I'm sure noticed that we had a newspaper article published in French with a certain unique sounding last name. And then a few years later, we have Marion changing her name to also have that same last name. So what exactly is going on there? Did Marion disappear on her own? Was she the one who was taking the money out from the banks that were located close to where her daughter lived? Did she decide to start a new life on her own? And if she did, where is she and why are the police unable to find her? These are all questions that we are going to address later now i know you guys probably have a ton of questions that we're not gonna be able to answer because we want to ruin it for you but feel free to shoot us an email at prosecutors pod on twitter or reach out to us at prosecutors pod on twitter facebook instagram shoot us an email prosecutors pod at gmail.com go to the website prosecutors podcast.com a lot of people have been asking where you can find the documents we reference we put everything up on the website usually on the first episode we'll have all the documents all the information all the sources so you can be researching this case even as we're talking about it so you know on john benet for instance that was a nine episode thing but all the documents that we were looking at were on that first episode so you could see them all uh, so you'll be able to see all those, too, if you want to get into that. Highly recommend the Lady Vanishes podcast. It's really great. A little warning to you. It can be a little slow in the beginning, particularly after the first three or four episodes, because what what they did is, it seems pretty clear, they had four or five episodes ready to go. And then this was an investigation, and they wanted those four or five episodes to spur new leads that they could follow up. So... After the first four or five episodes, there are a few where they're just kind of treading water. So, like, they go off and find some cults and talk to cults about what, why do people join cults? Because for all they know, Marion joined a cult, right? <laughs> and so, so those episodes are kind of filler. But after those, it is like a roller coaster from that point forward. Once they get into the investigation and start learning new things, it's crazy. So, really highly recommend that podcast. You should definitely check it 
out. Well, Alice, do you have anything else you want to mention before we sign off? No, but this is such a mind-boggling story. And just know, so far, there's been no crime, right? It's not structuring to take out $5,000 a day from your own bank account if you're not doing it for illicit purposes. You're allowed to drain your own bank account. You're allowed to change your name. You're allowed to disappear and not talk to your loved ones if you don't want to. You don't have to show up at family members' funerals. So just know, this is a strange story, but so far, there's been no crime, so to speak. So stay tuned because there are some really interesting questions I think that really dig deep into what happened here, if anything happened, and what does it mean to be lost, missing, or found? And I have to say, when I was listening to The Lady Vanishes, the first few episodes, I had a very strong feeling of Sally just needs to let this go. I felt like her family. I was like, I don't know. It seems like this lady just wants to disappear. You should just let her disappear. And I almost felt bad. I mean, there's a lot of sort of philosophical questions about this. I almost felt like the podcast was a bad thing because if she wanted to disappear and not be found, why are you looking for her? <laughs> like, stop looking for her. She's, you know, sitting on a beach somewhere in Tasmania drinking, I don't know, whatever they drink in Tasmania, right? And you guys are going to ruin it. But the more they look, just like I said, the more twists and turns there are. And there are a ton of twists and turns, and we're going to get into those in a in a episode very soon. One thing I will say before we sign off, CrimeCon is coming up. If you haven't made reservations to be in Las Vegas, do it. We want to see you there. Remember, you can use code PROSECUTORS for 10% off. Well, that is all we have for this week, but we will be back next week with more of this fascinating story. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. Oh. Unless you had something no, you wanted to add. No, there. that was fantastic. Yeah. It was just uh, no, you, you're just you're just so encouraging today, Alice. I, I you just... know what? When I'm not in trial and not exhausted, I can be a pleasant ah, person to be around. No. <laughs> this is so much more pleasant. Oh more. no! Wow. Come I'm on. Just touched. Come I'm on. moved. I really Goodness am. Gracious, is like that bad during trial? Probably was.
Stream the biggest movies and TV shows for free on Pluto TV. Watch movies like Titanic and G.I. Joe The Rise of Cobra, plus TV shows like CSI and Star Trek The Next Generation. Starting this month, check out the 24-7 Stargate channel exclusively on Pluto TV, plus hundreds of channels and thousands of movies and TV shows absolutely free. Download the free Pluto TV app on your favorite streaming device and start watching today. Progressive presents Forest Metaphors about bundling your home and auto. In sports, three goals is a hat trick. And when you bundle your home and auto with Progressive, you get a hat trick of great savings and round-the-clock protection. So you might be thinking, wait, that's two things. A hat trick is three. But in this metaphor, great savings counts as two goals, and so does round-the-clock protection. So it's like four goals, and that's more than three. It's basic math. Forced Metaphors, presented by Progressive. Bundle and protect today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discount not available in all states or situations.